All right. Thank you for coming out this evening uh, as we begin our 2022 year off on a uh, high note as far as I'm concerned. So our, our kind of our main goal this year, and I know I, I haven't went in depth into that, but we are going to do the book of Revelation here starting in a few weeks. And um, I didn't actually plan to do it this way. But we are, or we are going to do 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John before we begin the book of Revelation. Uh, we had actually done the book of Jude. We was just going through the New Testament. We did the book of Jude, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago. So it kind of worked out this way, and, and I like it as I began to study it out. I thought it was a good way to get started. So we are going to do the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It should take us about three weeks and we're going to jump right into it because we've got a lot of material to cover tonight. Because unlike me, we are going to do two chapters this evening. And I know you don't believe me, but we're going to. So um, let's get started with prayer first, and then we'll jump right into the Bible. And uh, here we go. Father, we thank you for all the good things you do for us, Lord. We thank you for bringing us together as a family to study your word, Lord. We ask you that you send your Holy Spirit, who is our guide and our teacher, to open up our hearts and our minds to you and your throne, and that you guide us and you give us that knowledge and wisdom that is promised to us in your word, Lord. These good people who are here and those who are watching on the internet do not need to hear my wisdom or to hear from me, Lord. So we want to hear directly from your throne and uh, you put this spirit in us to guide us. So so I ask you that you just uh, um, you confer with them that that your word is true and uh, we worship you. and We glorify you because of the for what we learn from the word about you. So. Again, we just love you and ask you that you be a big part of uh, everything we do here. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So I'm going to do a quick introduction into, into the, the book of 1 John, <clears throat> a little bit of biography of John himself. And, and I know we're only going to do two out of the five chapters of 1 John, but by the time we get done, you're going to feel like you got a good handle on the book of John and how to read it and all that good stuff. So... Um, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to First John. If you're watching at home, you can, I, I ask you that you go get a Bible or pull it up on your app on your phone or whatever that you do because you don't need to trust me. You want to read this with your own eyes. So let me begin. As the uh, name of the letter suggests, the guy who wrote this, his name is John, and he had many other writings that we have. So, and some of those includes these three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We also had the Gospel of John. These are called epistles. These are letters. We also had the Gospel of John, which is the, the story of Jesus. And then we also had the book of Revelation. And as, a, as I said, we're going to get into that next month. But, but look, this is an introduction of John, and this is going to last us for probably a long time, because whenever we begin Revelation, I'm not going to redo this on John again. But some of this information that you're going to hear tonight is pertinent to that. You will, you will get, uh, maybe you don't know how John finished out his life, and this is important. So, uh, I kind of made this bullet list of, of a few things that John has accomplished or who he, he who he was in life. And uh, so here we go. One he is he was one of the sons of Zebedee. And the other one was was his brother James. We know him as an apostle also as James the Lesser. There was a James the Greater and a James the Lesser. And, you know, don't don't get offended at, at calling him lesser. It just meant he was less in age. He was younger. So. uh Brother, James the Lesser, and, and I got scripture to back all that up, but we're just going to go with it because we do have a lot of material, but that's Matthew 27, 56. If you, if you want to see that with your own eyes, uh, holler and I'll, I'll give you those Bible verses. All right. John and James, along with two other guys named Andrew and Peter, and they had a small business, a small fishing business in their hometown of Capernaum. <clears throat> And if you don't know that whenever Jesus become of age, I don't know. We don't know when his dad, uh, uh, Joseph, I should say, uh, passed away. But Jesus's adult home, his adult home after he left 
Nazareth was Capernaum. So that's how they all met up. So again, John and James, along with Andrew and Peter, had a small fishing business in their town of, of Capernaum, where Jesus also lived. Uh, uh, Jesus nicknamed... So I always think of Peter being being the apostle who is hot headed and and because it just seems that John's kind of the mellow one that's always in the back and doesn't ask a whole lot of questions. But look, Jesus nicknamed John and James the sons of thunder because they wanted to destroy a small town in Samaria whenever they would not accept Jesus. So they wanted, you know, they wanted they was talking to Jesus and just asked them to whatever send fire and brimstone down to destroy the city. So that's when Jesus gave him that nickname of the sons of thunder. Uh, John's mother, uh, I know it gets confusing. John's mother's name was Mary, and she asked Jesus for preferred seating for her sons. Do you remember that in in Scripture? Uh, So John sat next to Jesus. During the the Last Supper, which John and Peter were the two who set the room up and got ready, got set everything up for the other apostles to come or the other disciples at that time to come. So, you know, if you look at the painting of the Last Supper, it's it's John that is uh, sitting next to Jesus and John and Peter were the uh, were the first to reach the empty tomb and to look in. Remember, Mary and the other Mary, they did not make it that far. They actually seen Jesus as he was coming to them, but it was Peter and John who took off running. If you read the story, I think John outruns Peter to get there. So he's the first one to look into the, to the empty tomb. Uh, all this is important. And, and I'll let you know why here as, as we get in closer. So I only got a few more. So uh, John, um, let me say it like this. He lived in Jerusalem. As you know, he was an elder of the first church, Christian church in Jerusalem for a long time. And he stayed there until Mary had passed away. And that's Mary, Jesus's mother, because you remember or recount what Jesus was on the cross. He it was John that he looked at and he said, behold, your mother. It says, behold your son. So he was given John the the charge to take care of his mother because it was Jesus's job as the eldest son. Jesus passed that on to John. So John lived in Jerusalem until Mary passed. And then he moved to Ephesus and and he spent. And, and this is where we start getting to a little bit uh, to say controversial. We know all this because when John was in Ephesus, he taught many people, many pastors, many Bible teachers, many missionaries, and they all wrote themselves. They wrote letters uh, themselves. So we know this from what we call church history. Is this is this information I'm getting ready to tell you in the Bible? No, but we know it from first count eyewitnesses at that time. But but John lived in Ephesus and he he it, he lived there whenever 70 AD happened or when came. So if you're not familiar, that's when Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. John was already in Ephesus. So because of that, because that's where John was, Ephesus kind of became the headquarters for the church. It left Jerusalem. Remember, James, the half brother of Jesus, he, he was killed in all that. They threw him from the top of the temple, right? The same temple that that Satan took Jesus and said, hey, if you if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this. Remember that whenever he tempted him in the wilderness, that was the same temple top that they throw James from. So they killed that. They, they destroyed that church. So Ephesus became the new headquarters. And that's because that's where John was. And uh, um, from Ephesus, here we go. From Ephesus, John wrote his gospel, the Gospel of John. He also wrote these three epistles. He also wrote the book of Revelation. And I know you're saying, well, wait a minute. He wrote that from Patmos, the prison island. Well, no. If you read it carefully, it said that in the book of Revelation, he says, I was at Patmos, past tense. So he was at the prison island when he received the vision or the dream, he went back to Ephesus and wrote the book of Revelation. 
some of this is is necessary to know because John is sitting in Ephesus whenever he writes the letters to the seven churches. And the first church that he writes to is Ephesus, right where he's sitting. No, this is John. This is not John the Baptist. This is the Apostle John or the disciple John. So John served as an elder in the early church. And again, he trained a whole lot of leaders. And that's why we have a whole lot of information on them, because those leaders, they wrote many letters themselves and they were preserved until today. And John died as an old man. He was not martyred. He's the only one of the disciples or the apostles who wasn't. He died as an elderly man in the city of Ephesus. All right. That's my little bullets on him. So to do a quick overview of first John itself, um, by going back in time and refreshing our, our memory, cause we've done, we've been going through the new Testament. You'll remember that Paul wrote his first letter to the pastor of Ephesus. Everybody remember that? Remember what the letter's called? First Timothy. Okay. So th that's the connection between first John and first Timothy is that they are having the same issue in the same church. And I don't know if you remember from 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 first Timothy, what issue that that Paul was writing about. That now John is writing about the same issue is a false teaching that is coming out called Gnostics or Gnosticism. So Gnostics simply believe. Let me say it like this. There are, there are a whole lot of truth mixed with a little bit of lies, enough to make it very toxic teaching. And what they taught was the flesh is wicked. The flesh is evil. And your soul or your spirit is holy. Which, so far, you're going, we're not too far off here. That's not too bad a teaching. But what they taught was one cannot affect the other. So in other words, you can sin, you can do anything in your flesh that you want to do. It'll never touch your soul or your spirit. You're still holy. You're still a child of God, regardless if, if you obey the word or not. You can do whatever you want to do. They even took it to the point to say that Jesus was not. Jesus was the son of of Mary and Joseph. And that he was just a man. But at his baptism. He was no longer a man, but he was a spirit, which was God, that the man had disappeared and God had come in his place. And the reason why the flesh and the spirit cannot be intermingled. So they're teaching that from the time that Jesus was baptized to the time that he was, I guess, arrested. They, they kind of say on the cross, but I would put it with him getting arrested, that he was a ghost a spirit only not in flesh and blood and then at his arrest the night of his arrest that spirit left and went back to heaven and the body came back down and that's what was crucified was the man jesus not the son of god see where that starts getting really weird it's it's <laughs> i'm going to use this word this year a lot it's kooky that's a kooky way to think of things and and that's what they did so um, let me see. I said, okay, two men, Peter and John, they're both writing letters. They're both fighting the same false teaching. And it's this Gnosticism, right? That's the big connection. The difference is there's about 20 years apart from first Timothy to first John. First Timothy was written about 64 A.D. and first John was written about 85 A.D., which, again, think of 70 A.D. as the time of the destruction of Jerusalem is 15 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. Get this in your mind. Also, the book of Revelation was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. This is important information. It, it, it's all going to I know you're going to have to wait quite a while for that, but that is going to come back together. All right. So he taught that Jesus was not, that the Gnostic teachers again taught that Jesus was never fully human. But but again, his physical body, then he was spiritual and then he was physical again. So John wrote these three letters as, a, as an attempt to combat that 
kooky teaching. I'm going to use it like that. So he desires that the church to understand that Jesus was indeed 100 percent human and he was 100 percent God at the same time. So Gnosticism, a little bit of truth or it's a lot of truth mixed with a little bit of lies enough to pervert the gospel message. John wants the church to know that he was an eyewitness to the living, breathing Jesus the whole time that they were saying he was a spirit. All right. And you're going to see this right from the very beginning because he says, this is the Jesus that I heard. This is the Jesus that I seen. This is the Jesus that I touched. Right. So he's building this case that Jesus was a human being, but he was also divine at the very same time. And he uses the terms that Jesus is light and he is love. So John wants us to understand Jesus in these practical terms that we can use and we can apply to our lives. So in other words, John just isn't responding to the false teachers of what the, the Gnostics was teaching. He is also trying to encourage and strengthen the church. He wants them to know that they are truly children of God. Why? Because the Gnostic teachers, they want power over the church. They want the saints money. And they do this by claiming that they have this secret knowledge that nobody else has. John does not claim that. He never claims to have secret knowledge. As a matter of fact, he's teaching the opposite. He's saying, this is how you can know for sure. So that's what the, the letter of 1 John is. How do you know that you're a child of God? That's that's that is his message. He wants us to know if you are saved. And he gives us three ways to do it in this first letter. And that brings us to our layout. And you'll see the three ways. So first, John. Chapter one, verses one through four is simply the introduction. We, we will we're going to get through that. and We're going to get through this second line down here. Chapter one, verse five. All the way through chapter two, which is uh, ends in verse 29. So you can know for certain that you're a believer. I just put certainty, but you can know you are for certain that you are a believer by living in the light. Next week, we're going to conquer the next two certainty by living in love and certainty by living in faith. How do you know that you're a believer? Three ways, light, love and faith. And he's going to lay all that out for you. This is how you can know. And of course, the conclusion is, is just the ending. So we're going to do this part this week. We're going to do, uh, yeah, just this one line here next week, because that's two whole chapters in its own. And the week after that, two weeks from now, we're going to do chapter five. And we're also going to do John chapter two and John chapter three, because they're really short. They don't even have chapters. John chapter two is basically... These Gnostic teachers, he's telling the church, don't encourage them. Don't support them financially. Don't even look their direction. He doesn't say you go out and tar and feather them or you hang them from a tree or nothing like that. He's just saying don't support them. The church took it so far that they wouldn't support the good teachers, the, the ones who was teaching the gospel. Matter of fact, as we get to John chapter three, you'll see that there was a pastor of a church who would not only support uh, Bible teachers, traveling teachers, that he said, if you do, I'm throwing you out of my church. That's in John chapter three or third John. I'm sorry. So, OK, all that for an introduction. We still got two more chapters to go. So here we go. First, John. Chapter one. Verse one, I'm going to read verses one through four, because that is the introduction. And it says this. It says, we proclaim to you the one who existed. Remember, he's trying to he's trying to tell you, I've I've seen this guy. I've heard him. I touched him. Right. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what 
we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you will have fellowship with us. He uses the term fellowship throughout these letters as meaning that you're in, you're a believer, that you're in the fellowship of believers or you're in the church, right? And he, he goes on to explain it. And our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. So John was an eyewitness to Jesus' life from His baptism all the way through His death, burial, and resurrection, and even to His ascension. He was one of them that was standing there when Jesus gave the Great Commission and then left. So again, stepping back, stepping back for a moment, and think about this. If two people are trying to tell you about a movie, one has seen the movie and one, one says he hasn't seen the movie, who are you going to believe what the, what the plot is about? So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's wacky to believe that someone will step and, and just to pull a movie out of the thin air because it's like one of my favorites, but Mighty Python's Quest for the Holy Grail, right? I know Roy hasn't seen it because we've talked about it. So if he was to get up here and I say, now this is what this movie is about. And Roy goes, no, it's about this. Who would believe the guy who never seen it? So that's John's point. I was there. I seen Jesus. I heard him. I touched him. These guys have it. Who are you going to believe? Right? So John is saying, look, I've personally witnessed this life of Jesus. What I tell you isn't my opinion. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't no secret knowledge. I am telling you what I lived. What I know is a fact. The only guy, <laughs> I said the only other guy who, who, who wasn't there was this guy. And, and you, you know, who are you going to believe on which one's done this, right? So isn't it odd, though, that, that John never refers to Jesus by name here? He converts back to his descriptions of Jesus whenever he wrote the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. And, and I, I've got them written out here. Just real quick. First John verse one, chapter 1, or verse 1, he says, From the beginning, that's how he started out John, the, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. I have a feeling I'm going to lose you on this. First uh, John verse 1 calls Jesus the word of life, which was in the Gospel of John, verses 1 and 4. In the second verse that we read, it calls Jesus the life. And in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 1, verse 4, calls Jesus the life. Again, I'm not going, I'm going to quit doing those because I feel like those are getting confusing. He calls Jesus the eternal life. He says that Jesus was with the Father and he was revealed to us. So that's what? One, two, three, four, five, six ways that he referred, referred to Jesus. The same in, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, the same as he did in 1 John in the first four verses. Just the introduction. So although that John never refers to Jesus by name, he gives us all those ways, six ways that we can know for sure that he is talking about Jesus, the Son of God. And if you know me, you know, it's the name above all other names and, and all those things that you heard. That's not the name of Jesus. It's the name of the Son of God. It's the one and only, the only begotten. That's, that's what makes Jesus. Yeah, anyways. So, so he also gives us some physical ways that we can connect to Jesus or how he was connected with Jesus. He said, I heard him speak. I've seen him with my own eyes and I've touched him with my own hands. So. With John's interactions with Jesus, we can know that it wasn't a secret knowledge. Again, that's what the Gnostics are claiming. See, he was, that Jesus wasn't truly a living, breathing human being, not a spirit. Now, put it like this. Here's the skinny. Jesus was with the Father from the very beginning. What Jesus has received from the Father, he has passed on to the apostles while Jesus was doing his ministry here on this earth. Those apostles took everything that they had learned, everything they seen, heard, and touched, and now they're passing it on to the church. He's passing it on to us so that we may have what he calls 
eternal life, or what, how he puts it is we, that we may have fellowship together. So John concludes this introduction section with, the, with the, that this fellowship, being a part of the church, being a Christian, is what brings us joy. Did he not say it in verse 4? He said, we write these things so that you may fully share our joy. So without coming out and saying it, he's kind of reading between the lines. He is saying, if you're in this fellowship, you can have joy. If you're not in this fellowship, no, no hope for joy. So how do we know for certain that we are in this fellowship with the Father? That's where he's, he's taken us to. And the first step was that you, are, you live in the light. Certainty by living in the light. So before we jump into verse 5, let's remember that, that these people were struggling. The, the people who, who, the church in Ephesus, they were struggling with their, with their relationship or their fellowship with the Father. They was listening to these false teachers and they were starting to doubt that they was children of God. They were starting to doubt the, the teachings from the apostles and they were starting to listen to these other people. So John wanted to give them this proof. Remember I said he's encouraging the church. He wants to give them this proof that you are indeed saved. And proof that they are a new creature in Christ, that they don't need that special knowledge. So in chapters 1 and 2, John gives the believers four ways that they can know that they're living in the light. I love these. If you know me, I'm a big bullet list guy. So um, four ways that we know that we can live in the light. And we're going to do all four of those tonight. And uh, yeah, so here we go. Four ways that, that we know that, we can, that we're living in the light. And the first one is your personal behavior. We're going to read all these verses because believe it or not, there's only what, like nine verses in chapter one. So here we go. We're going to start in chapter one, verse five. We're going to read all the way through two six. It says this. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. So he's, he's saying firsthand information. I heard it from Jesus. Now this is you. God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. If we were lying, we w- so we would be lying if we... Now let me read this again. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we will have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. There's only one way to be cleansed from sins, the blood of Jesus. Verse 8, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Kind of get it that, and again, he doesn't point out what the Gnostics are teaching, but you, you can hear him say, my, my spirit, right, is, is holy. It is perfect. It's okay. It's okay to, for my flesh to sin because my spirit man can't be touched or harmed and because and, my spirit man don't sin. That's what he's getting to here. Right? So verse 9, which is an iconic Bible verse, one of our pastor's favorites. It says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Remember, they're claiming that their souls, their spirits are holy. Because verse 10 starts it back out. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Chapter 2. My dear children, I am writing to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Remember how he says, truly righteous. It's Jesus that's righteous, not you, (laughs) right? He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but for the sins of the world. Verse 3, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Personal behavior. We know that we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Verse 4, if someone claims I know God but does not obey his commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. Verse 5, 
But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So that's why I named the first one personal behavior. So a person who is living in the light recognizes a few things about their own personal behavior. They, they recognize they are sinners. They don't try to hide it. They don't try to pretend it. They, try, they don't try to lie that I'm not a sinner. Or I'm perfect. My soul, is spirit, my soul is holy. Nothing I can do, right? They admit it. Man, I'm a sinner saved by grace. They come to God the only way that you can, through the blood of Jesus. And it says specifically that it is the blood that cleanses us from all sin. Another one. They, they confess their sins and they seek forgiveness regularly. Did you ever notice that whenever they ask Jesus, when the, when the disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray, that Jesus asked for forgiveness? The man who never sinned, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So the repentance is a, is a daily thing. Repentance is, is moving away from the world and toward God. So that Jesus told them, this is how you pray. And I just thought it was, you know, anybody ever think of Jesus asking for forgiveness? Did he not? So here we go. Um, the, the way that the believers, how they, how they recognize themselves is they try to make every attempt at being, or I should say mimicking Jesus. Now, here I go. This is a personal thing. So it's called the glorious standard, right? We have this glorious standard that we're supposed to meet, but we can't get there. We just, whatever we do to try, we can't get there. And it isn't that you're not saved because you can't get there, right? We're not going to get there until we are, till the corruptible flesh is made incorruptible. That's that the, the resurrection of the saints. We're never going to get to be like Jesus until that day. Then we'll be like him. But, but, we, we make, that's why I use the word attempt. We make every attempt to try to mimic Jesus. All right. So the other side of the coin, the other side of the coin, because there's always two sides, right? How do you know that you're not living in this fellowship? How do you know that you're living in darkness? Well, you claim that you have never sinned. Uh, I do not sin. I don't need forgiveness, right? You do, you never make any attempt to try to live by God's word. How many of you have met somebody, oh, I'm a Christian, but they make no attempt to live by God's word. Matter of fact, they don't even know what it is to even try. As a matter of fact, they live contrary to what God's word says. Not that we're judging, but we can look at the fruit. <laughs> right? So, all right. Number two, we're moving on. Personal behavior. Love other Christians. We all know this. This isn't rocket science. Uh, I'm going to read. Uh, we're still in chapter two. I'm going to read verses seven through 14 this time. And it says this, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you have heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. I'm kind of letting you pause for a second, let that sink in. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I am living in the light, that's what we're doing, right? Living in the light. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a, bro a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. That's, that's black and white. So then he, go, he does these next few verses here 
uh, three verses to explain to you exactly who he's talking to. And notice that the, the first time around, he, he, he does everybody twice here. First time around is it's in the present tense. I pay a lot of attention to tense too. He, Cause it says I'm writing. That's present tense. And then when it starts verse 14. It says I have written. All right. So verse 12, it says I am writing to you who are God's children. Writing to the ones who are in the fellowship. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. So uh, he's writing to the believers. He's writing to those who have been a believer for a long time and those who are just now believers and everybody in between. So I don't know why he went through all that just to say, I'm writing to everybody, all believers, everybody's in the fellowship. But now he goes into the past tense. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. So notice the tense of one is also past. You have already won your battle with the evil one. Uh, so, so you can know that you are living in the light with a very simple test. Do you love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? If someone comes to you and you, they say, I'm a believer your love, I don't know how you say it, your, 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 your love is just automatically turned on. That's it. That's as simple as I can make it. If you do, you're living in the light. If you don't, you're living in darkness. But before you answer the question, remember that love is a verb. And that's why I paused whenever I, I said that Jesus was living the truth of this commandment. Because he didn't just say, I love, you know, God so loved the world. It was demonstrated. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was the demonstration that, that Jesus did love. Is that he was willing to give his life. Now, you know, how do you show the, the greatest love is to lay down your life for a friend? So. Love is an action. It isn't a warm and fuzzy feeling. Yeah. This is Jerry again. My flesh. I know Christians who I think are jerks. <laughs> but I still love them. Just for no other reason is that they're a believer. Uh, okay. I put it this in, in John chapter or verses 12 through 14. John just confirms that he's speaking to every believer young and mature all the way through. All right. Number three. Third way is to live repentive lives. Remember, I said that opened up with that kind of if it's an it's an everyday deal. So there's only a few verses here. So I'm going to start in verse 15, read 15, 16 and 17. John says it like this. Do not love the world nor the things it offers. For when you love the world, you do not love, you don't have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only cravings for physical pleasures. A craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from the world. But this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God lives forever. So um, that one was really quick. But look, again, the Gnostic teachers, they were teaching that the only way, the only way to live a spiritual life was to be separated from your bodies. That, that Remember, I said the two can't coexist. Remember, I said that Jesus had to leave in a physical body, had to come in a spiritual body, and then his spiritual body left and his physical body came to get came back. They can't coexist. That's not what John's teaching here. John's teaching just the opposite. He's, he, he said that, that you know that you, you can live forever if you don't crave what this world craves. So uh, let, let me see where I'm at. Um, nope. All right. So John teaches something quite different. 
He teaches that we can live in this world and we can still live in the light. If we do, if we do not love this world or the things that it has to offer, we're living in the light. So if we crave what this world has to offer, we will we will die with this world. Remember, he said it's fading away. We will fade away also. So if we love God instead, we will live forever. There's there's your choices. The Bible's full of choices. That's the that's the mosaic covenant. If you do this, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll curse you. Here is he saying as if if you obey me, you live in the light, you live forever. If you crave and follow for the things that the world has to offer, you'll you'll die with this world. Last one. Remaining faithful to the truth. So um, I'll just say a, a real quick word about the word remain. To me, and I know that not everybody reads the Bible the same. We can read the same verse and get two different things out of it. We're going to see the word remain. When it says remain, to me, it's like you're here and then you're not here. You didn't remain. You was there once, but now you're not, right? So here we go. Um, We're going to start in verse 18 and read to the end. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard it. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. Now, if I if I might just there is the Antichrist, the one and only. He is the beast, the little horn, the son of perdition. He has all kinds of names. Gog of Magog, uh, the king of the north. I can go on and name other names. That is the Antichrist. Then there is other such Antichrists. That is anybody, it's a, just take the word anti, anti means you're, you're the opposite of. So anybody that was opposite of Jesus is an antichrist. There's thousands, probably millions on the earth today, right? So, you, I mean, we can just go back in, in history and look at Hitler and, and Nero and all them and definitely say that they was a spirit of antichrist. So that's what he's getting at. There is the antichrist and there's other antichrists also. Um, let me start over with verse 18 again. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. I don't mean to quit, keep stopping, but it just pops up to me. If you don't know the apostles, well, the Bible, from the time that Jesus ascended, I should probably say the day of Pentecost, until he comes back at his second coming is the last days or the last hour, right? It's been over 2,000 years now. It's still the last days, last hour, okay? Verse 19, these people left our churches, but they never really belonged to us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. But you are not like that. For the Holy One has given you his spirit and all of you know the truth. So I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. You know who I'm sorry. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the father and the son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the son doesn't have the father either. But anyone who acknowledges the son also has the father. So John is making a clear difference between him and the Gnostic teachers. He's saying, you know, I have fellowship with the father. They don't. Verse 24. So you must remain You must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. And that's the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. It says, if you do, you will remain in fellowship with the son and with the father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he has promised us. Verse 26, I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Talking about the Gnostic but you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So don't need so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. You guys don't need me or anyone else to teach you what is true. Why? 
You have the Holy Spirit inside of you who confirms this message with you, right? You, you've, you've heard a preacher. Uh, uh, can I say that? Heard a preacher not too long ago. I was on TV. He, he, don't freak out. He's in Florida. But, but I watched him and, and I'm sitting there shaking my head. No. He, he's saying points that I don't, I don't quite agree with. He had 14 points in a sermon. Remember that, Pam? So we're watching it with other people in the room. And he would make a point that was not true. And then he would read a Bible verse that had nothing to do with the point that he just made. The, the Bible verse that he read, I agree with it 1,000%, but it did not apply to what he was trying to teach. But the other people in the room was going, amen. <laughs> and when, the, when, the, when they got done, when, when it was watching it on YouTube, when it, when it was over, I don't know why they pick on me. Because I read the Bible to you. I'm smarter than anybody else. I have no idea, all right? I'm like, like a sixth grade reading education. But anyways, what do you think, Jerry? Do you believe that? Well, no, I don't. Well, he used the Bible. Yes, he did. But he didn't use the Bible to prove his point. So you don't. That's what I'm, I'm just trying to make. It did not. It wasn't confirmed in my spirit. It doesn't have to be something that I already know. If I hear a preacher and I love, I love to hear a preacher or a teacher say something, I'll go, huh, never seen it that way before. And, but you, you, I get that confirmation in my spirit that what he's saying is 100% true. I just, I just didn't know that yet. But, but you've also heard stuff, you're going, that ain't right. That's what he's talking about. You have the Holy Spirit in, in you that confirms if someone's telling the truth or not. And he's telling these believers, he goes, look, I've seen the movie. <laughs> this guy hasn't seen the movie. Let that spirit tell you who's telling you the truth here. Okay. So um, let me start over again. Verse 27, it says, but you have received the Holy Spirit who lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true for the spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. How many of you ever need to be told that the Holy Spirit doesn't lie to you? Yeah, whatever. All right, here we go. So just as he had taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And now, dear, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. So, so again, there's nothing wrong, thankfully, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with someone who teaches the Bible. As a matter of fact, that is one of the five-fold ministries or gifts that God gave to the church, right? That, that's the, the pinky on the hand, right? So, so that is a gift that God has given to the church. But there are a few criterias that a Bible teacher must, must, uh, 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 live up to because if they don't they're an antichrist those are i got them here uh they must acknowledge that that jesus uh he, they must acknowledge him as the christ in other words he is the holy anointed one he is the son of god if they don't if they say anything different get away number two they must teach what was handed down from the prophets and the apostles Nothing more, nothing less. I, I'm really interested, and I have read them, not all of them, but the, you know, the other books of the Bible or the the, the um, History Channel tries to be dramatic, and they'll say the banned books from the Bible. Now, I've read a handful of them. Read the Book of Enoch, the Book of Adam and Eve. That was really interesting. Uh, um, What's some of the others? The Apocalypse of Peter. I've read that one more than once. They're fine to read. The letters that, that remember, we opened up with John taught all these, uh, all these preachers and teachers, and they all wrote letters themselves. Those are fine to read. Uh, I, I think I did mention the book of Enoch, didn't I? Yeah, so, so look, those are really good books to read, and probably a lot of them is true, but they're not the Word of God. So, if someone's trying to teach you something different from the book of Enoch, say, no, you know, Noah, did, Noah and 
his family wasn't the only ones that survived. There was these people who saw, survived. The book, I don't, the book, book Enoch doesn't say that. But if someone did, they just must use the Bible, nothing else. I don't know how to say it any plainer. All right. So the third one is uh, their teaching must bear witness with the Holy Spirit that is inside of you. Right. That Holy Spirit was put inside of you the very moment that you become a believer or or I'm, I'm going to use John's terminologies. The very moment that you become in a fellowship with God, you receive the Holy Spirit. And that's got to be a confirmation with that. If that spirit will start telling you right away, don't don't listen to that. That's not right. So it took for me, I'm going to give you my, my uh, small, short, short, very short uh, personal journey here is. I didn't read the Bible for myself in the beginning, probably like most believers. I, I got saved, listened to my Sunday school teacher. I had an adult Sunday school teacher, listened to my pastor, never questioned anything. And then I started reading the Bible for myself. And I'm like, something's not, something's not adding up. You know, the things that they're saying is not in there and they're not saying what really is in there. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, nothing major, but it was little things enough to make me want to go a different direction. And I think that's what Martin Luther did so that the church was trying to tell the people how to believe. And it didn't set with Martin Luther's spirit. So he took it upon himself to learn how to speak or how to read Hebrew and Latin and and Greek and come to find out because he was German right uh, come to find out that's not what the church is teaching they're church they're teaching something different so what was it 96 96 he nailed the 96 theses or whatever 96 things that the church was teaching that wasn't biblical he nailed it to the front door <laughs> they didn't like it right so that he, if you don't know how the story ends, he, he uh, translated the Bible into German so that the common person could read the Bible for themselves and not listen to the church leadership, and they burned him at the stake for it. That's how Martin Luther died. So, so that, that, but it started with the Holy Spirit telling Martin Luther, something's not right about that. You know, you don't need to give a, the church a thousand dollars so your mom don't have to go to purgatory for a thousand years. You know, it's that kind of stuff, right? So, anyways, that's the that's the criteria. It's a teacher in Christ or an antichrist. That's the criteria you need to ask yourself. So, real quick, I got a, a summary because my time is up. Um, this is my summary. It's real short. John gave us four ways that we can know that we that we believers how we are living in the light. Remember the four ways? The four ways. Personal behavior, love other Christians, live a repentant life, and remain faithful to the truth. You've got to remain faithful to it. So four ways that we know that we can live in, living in the life. And because of that, that's a gauge. That's some way that you can gauge not only us. you got to look at this as a personal, this is how you gauge yourself. But you also gauge the church. You gauge a preacher. You gauge a Bible teacher. Are they doing these four things? If not, find someone else. Don't, again, don't take it upon yourself to bring them down. I'm going to bring that person down. The Bible never says that. As a matter of fact, it says the opposite. Who's going to inherit the earth? The meek, right? Just find somebody else. So I put, and because of that assurance, we can look forward with hope to the return of Jesus. We are not afraid or ashamed of that time, but we look forward to it because we know that he is coming to reward those who are living in the light and he's coming to punish those who are living in darkness. So that's why we look forward to it. We're looking forward to the reward, the reward, eternal life in the kingdom of God. So come back next week and we are going to look and you can see that it's little little larger but we can know for certain certainty that we are a believer when, when by living in love Does everybody feel like they got a whole lot better handle on first john already in the first week it, it, it's it's simply laid out how how it is this is proof that you're a believer and he gives you three ways it's, book of john is that easy so here we go father 
Thank you for these people who who are here and those who have been watching on the Internet. Lord, I pray that your word has been confirmed in their spirit, Father. I know it has in mine. And, uh, you know, you are you are. You are the light. We've seen that tonight. You are the light. We love you, Father. We look forward to your coming of your son because we do know he's coming to bring his rewards. So I ask you, Father, that that we walk out these doors tonight and those who are going to turn off their computers and and go about their days. Lord, that, that they not forget the words that was spoken here, not my word, your word not be spoken, uh, they not be forgotten tonight, Lord. It doesn't do us any good to learn new revelations if, if we walk away from the mirror and forget what we look like. So I ask you, Father, that, that you allow these things to stick in our memory, Lord, that you would bring them to recountants whenever, whenever somebody puts doubt into our minds that we are truly a son of God, the ones, the naysayers, Lord, whenever they come against us. And we can go back and revert back to these scriptures and say, no, your word tells me I am a child of God. And this is how I know. It's because John gave us this gauge that we can gauge ourselves, Lord. So allow that to be nourishment to us and encouragement to our lives. I pray, Lord, that we put the kingdom of God first in our life so you can take care of all the stuff that comes up. That's a promise from your word, Lord. I ask you that you protect our, our us and our families uh, from pandemics or anything else that might come against us, Lord. We, we place our health, we replace our safety and our well-being into your capable hands because we trust you as the sovereign God. We love you and thank you for all that you are. And in Jesus' name, church said... See you next week. Same time.